Hi everyone, tutorial time. Welcome to a, another Jupyter Notebook. I would like to start our uh, tutorial on natural language processing with you today. You remember that this was an important part of the lecture and therefore I plan to devote three to four tutorials on the topic of natural language processing. So that is the first one. We will first of all cover some fundamentals, some basics, how we can use text or how we can process text and map it to a numeric form, to a one, uh, one hot uh, representation, for instance. So just the basics today. And in the second part, we'll start building some models for text processing. I'm going to sketch how we can set up an LSTM for language modeling. Again, that was covered in quite some depth in the lecture, so we should have a look at how corresponding carousel code could look like. And I also want to touch shallowly today and then more deeply in future tutorials on the topic of embedding, embedding layers. Remember, the term embedding describes a mechanism or an algorithm that we can use in order to translate a word to some vector representation. Translating a word to a dense vector, the elements of which carry some syntactic or semantic meaning. It's, it's crucial to think about and talk about embeddings when you're serious in NLP. And we will only scratch the surface in this tutorial, but I can tell you that we're going to look at that in a lot more detail than in future notebooks. Anyways, uh, let's not jump too far ahead. Let's rather get started with some fundamentals and revisit the common steps in a NLP pipeline. Right, so I prepared that notebooks. In my version, much of the code is left out and I will then implement it while we go along. And as usual, you'll find the fully, um, not fully comprehensive, but at least the notebook with all the codes in our GitHub repository. For part one, I will, use, I will make use of a nice library called NLTK, Natural Language uh, Processing Toolkit. It's very neat, has a bunch of useful functionality available for us. It's particularly useful to interact with several dictionaries that matter in the scope of NLP. And this is why I, why I picked it. It's one of these libraries, however, that you will probably have to install on your own. I, um, unless they change something, it's not part of the Anaconda Python distribution. And um, with Colab, well, to be honest, I don't remember whether it's by default installed on Colab or not, but at least some of you will have to install that. And when you install that, um, well, best is to run a little web, web search because you need to install the library and then using the library, you can download a bunch of additional functionality such as dictionaries. It will not install or download everything that is available by default. That would just be too much. Um, I'm sketching some code here. I can just import the library, import NLTK. For me, this will work because my machine is readily set up. You might have to install it. And when you do so, then after installing the NLTK toolkit, NLTK library, you will have to run these commands here, nltk.download, and then you can download some dictionaries or in general additional functionality. And today we'll use uh, these, these bits here. We need a library or a dictionary to handle stop words. That's punct, stop words, Punctuation, sorry, we need that bit. And uh, well, there's a brief part on WordNet, so I'd also download the WordNet dictionary. Anyways, uh, that's setting up the infrastructure. Obviously, we also need some text. Uh, here's my piece of text, very tiny, just one famous quote. Hope no need to quote is put here. Um, well, should you not be familiar with that, just run a Google search and it will shed some light on what famous book that is coming from. Oh, if you don't care, no, no matter, no, no problem. We just need a bunch of text. And now that we've got that, now that we have a long string 
consisting of several sentences, which of which consists of several words, we can start playing with that. And normally, the first task that we perform is to tokenize our text, splitting it up into bunches. And we'll split it up into words, which is maybe the most intuitive um, way of handling text, processing it at the word level. And to do that, we'll make use of some NLT key functionality. So um, it's, it's a fairly rich library. It might take a little while to well, get used to it. Hopefully, here and in the following tutorials, we'll get most of the functions that you really need in your day-to-day -day work so that you don't have a hard time with that. So uh, word tokenize is always pain with me and trying to multitask. I either can type or I can speak, but I have difficulties doing both at the same time. Right. Different tokenizers are supported by NRTK. We use the or word tokenizer, and if everything goes well, that should split up our words into individual tokens, our long string into individual tokens, but obviously um, an LTK, here we go. So it's as easy as that. One function, if you know where to find it, as always, the right function is available for us somewhere. We have split it up at the word level. You might wonder, how is that achieved? Actually, well, there are certain rules how that's, that's done. Um, obviously, using the blanks in between the text, you will note, however, uh, look at that bit here. The the dot, also that one here, is treated as an individual token. So it's it's not removed or anything. Punctuations are are not removed. We've just split our long string into individual tokens, and anything that's not a blank ends up in one of these tokens. Same with the question mark here, for instance, yet another token, and so forth. Let me clear this output. Now that we've seen it, I will simplify my code. So once we've tokenized it, we typically end up with cleaning some of the well, some of the tokens. Uh, for instance, let's say um, we build that up bit by bit. So let's say this is token uh, twelve tokens. Now we have token two, which is tokens after some cleaning. One thing that is convenient is to map everything to lowercase letters because then we once we filter our tokens, two words with different, different capitalization will not up, end up as two individual tokens, and rather they will end up as the same word. That is useful. And well, also, if we really are only interested in, in the word, we might want to get rid of anything that is not a word, numbers, something like that. We might want to get rid of that. Uh, for instance, what we could use is list comprehension here. That's quite common when working with NLTK. So we could, for example, say for uh, word in tokens, tokens is a list. The tokenization has given me a list of individual tokens. I can work with that list. Uh, if word dot is, and then here I basically make use of some string post processing functions, is, is alpha, is alphanumeric, and then we can map that to lowercase. Any word that comes out of this iteration here is in tokens and also is alphanumeric, will be converted to lowercase and then goes into tokens number two. Have a look at that. So now everything is nice, lowercase. That thing, something we note, and what you can also note here is that the punctuation is gone. So the is alpha function that Python supports for strings has helped me to basically get rid of the punctuations, which is nice. And normally, 
we, you can spend quite some time on doing this cleaning with, with real data. If you get some data from the web, maybe using web scraping, and then you want to process this data, building some nice NLP models, you will find yourself spending quite a lot of time on cleaning the text. And I just wanted to briefly, well, mention that um, what many people use and like for text processing and cleaning is a mechanism called regular expression. And honestly, you might not have heard about it, and that is um, not a reason to criticize you. It's a very computer science thing, maybe. Or, well, if you have done some web programming, then you'll probably know what regular expressions are about. But, but otherwise, not sure why you why you should or would know that. Essentially, that's a, a family of functions for text processing. We all know from um, Words or, or Google Docs or whatever is your favorite text processing software, text editor, you know this function where you can search text uh, or you can search and replace text, right? And imagine something like that, but a lot more powerful. What I mean by more powerful, if you say you write a document in Word and you want to search your text, you can key in uh, the start of the word you're looking for, and then get results. But that's pretty much it. What you could not do, for example, is with Word, defining a search pattern. Say you want to search your text for all the email addresses that it contains. Well, we do know that a valid email address has some clearly defined format. There is an at sign. To fourth dot, and after the at sign, there is the domain, and then in front of the domain, well, there is some sort of name, but there are clearly defined rules of what is a feasible name and what is not. For instance, certain special characters may not be used in email. Okay, so something like that, a a way of defining what you're looking for by patterns like, well, you're looking for an email address, which is something like a name, then at, then a domain, whereby since it is a domain, I know that there is some name, like HU minus Berlin or Amazon or whatever, and then there is a dot, and then there is an ending. There is a top level domain. And well, I also know that the set of top level domains is finite. There is com, there is edu, there is org, there is de, all these um, country specific uh, domains. But not every two or three letter acronym is a valid top level domain. So I could spend quite a lot of time designing a search pattern for an email. And that is what regular expressions allow you to do so. Um, well, obviously you will have to look much, much, much deeper if you really want to know uh what they can do i just want to highlight that um nltk would also allow you to use regular expressions for tokenization for instance let me redo the previous example using a regular expression just to show it so i need to import class tokenizer And that class of which I create an object is the regex tokenizer. And when creating my my object, I basically need to put in a string where the string describes my regular expression. That's a little regular expression here. The R is just regex, so not to worry. That just says that the text I'm keying in here is a regular expression or it's meant to be one. And then I'm using backslash W. That's a placeholder. W is for words, so um, letters, not words, nonsense. It's for letters. So this backslash W, when looking, when scanning a text, it will match letters. And then having a plus sign here, one or more letters, a, a subsequence of my text containing one or more letters will match this regular expression, whereas a blank will not. And 
well, using that for tokenization, I can then use these regular expression things in order to tokenize my text. So we use the tokenize functions, we put in our initial text, which, well, I convert to lowercase once again. Well, I don't store the result because it's supposed to be the same one. Um, that was a little excursion to be really honest, but if NLP is your thing, then you have to know about regular expression. So now at least you have heard about it. You've seen one example, although it just redid what we did before. So I know it's not super interesting, but uh, note that this is possible. All right, uh, so on we go. Next thing in our list is uh, stop word removal. We use some more NDK functions. There is obviously a functionality to handle stop words. Oops, typo, sorry about that. And um, well, for stop words, they are language depending. So um, I need to specify which one I want, stop words. For instance, um, we can say that we are interested in a list of English stop words or stop words in the English language. Um, let's see, yeah. And then you get this list here. And if you scroll along, you see, but it's pretty comprehensive. Bunch of stop words, pretty much everything you could think of is in here. That's nice. And just looking at the output in detail, you see, okay, that's actually a list. If you don't believe me, obviously I can prove my point. Here we are, it's a list. Meaning that if that is a list, um, it's just standard data structure in Python, we can use, or we can do everything we can do with lists. We can iterate them and, uh, and also we could, well, augment them actually quite easily. Let's say, um, say uh, a, a, a word you would like to add. Well, it's a little bit debatable. Really, the, the, the list of stop words is quite comprehensive, so it probably does not miss out a, a real and actual stop word. But why do you care about stop words? You might want to kick them out of your text because you believe they don't matter. And since, as we, as we show next, it's, it's quite easy to kick out the stop words, you might want to, you know, bend this, this list here a little bit, adding some words that you don't like, that you don't want to be part of your text, and by adding them to the stop word list and then just using the stop word list to kick out all the words in that list, you might get some nice functionality for your NLP workflow. So it's a list uh, and hence we can append that list, uh, just going append and then um, a word I dislike, we just add it, right? And then getting out the list once again. Well, we don't need the, the, the full list because it will be appended to the end. And there is our custom stop word. Going with that. That's, that's quite nice because as I said, the idea of this list here is basically that we compare our text to our stop word list and then get rid of everything in the text that's part of the stop word list. That's how we use stop word filtering. So let's do that. We create token three, which is basically a augmented version, an improved version of tokens two. And um, again, it's common practice to use list comprehension. So I just take every word um, that basically uh, is found in my previous list, tokens two. Uh, but I say if a word not in, and here I go, stop words. 
As simple as that. One line of code as promised. So if it's not in the stop word list, that word is basically gathered in another list, and that list is going to be my token three. Let's check. Here we are. There is our list. And maybe, okay, it was a famous quote, but I haven't spent that much time on it. Uh, let's let's compare. So our text. I wonder if I have been changed in the night. And you see, I wondered. I is gone. If I had been changed, it's all gone. I wonder and changed is what what remained from the very first sentence. Um, Maybe we could also print I wonder if I Let's get some more have been. But you see in our stop word remove list, wonder and changed, that has remained and all the rest is gone because it was part of the stop word list. So that's neat. Good, good, good. Making good progress here. Clear output. Go on. Next thing. Punctuations gone. Stop words gone. Um, how much tokens do we have left? Eighteen. Okay. Well, it's a short text, but these steps will filter you or will will reduce the number of words in your corpus. But uh, typically, you want to reduce that further. And we learn about stemming and also lemmatization. I was probably planning to delete this code here. Um, sorry for that. Um, from NLTK, we need some more functionality. From um, dot stem import. And well, you might remember that if you want to reduce a word to its dictionary form, which is what lemmatization is about, you need a dictionary, obviously. It's, it's more advanced than stemming, where you just cut off the last n letters, essentially, from a word. That's easy. You can do that without any dictionary. Well, there are some more into stemming. I'm simplifying things. But anyways, for lemmatization, you, you will need a dictionary underneath. And this is why we were downloading this WordNet dictionary earlier on. It allows us to now use the WordNet lemmatizer. And with, with that, um, we can basically, well, let me try out, let, let me show you how that works. Um, you see the code below already. You can use that by calling, by invoking the lemmatizer. Lemmatize. Let's create an object. We can lemmatize a word. Let's say the word gone. Um, dictionary form reduced to gone. Um, okay, very interesting. Um, let's say we use stripes. That's better. Okay, so the dictionary form of stripes, according to the lemmatizer, is stripe. Um, actually, there is one thing um, you can specify what form you are looking for. And this is what I wanted to um, to show you down there. Um, if we are looking for that as a noun, we specify that with this argument post here. But we could also say, no, actually, we want a different form. We want the word form. And then you see how the result is different. Now we have the result strip. So um, that option we've got. 
and need to make a choice when lemmatizing our roots. Here's my code to finally get the next list of tokens. I'm using both versions here, chaining them with an intermediate step. And now we have further reduced our text to that list here, where every word is mapped to its dictionary form. I also included a little example here for stemming, which works in the same way. You just create a stemmer class, maybe that of a portal, you use a portal stemmer, you create an object, that object gives you the function stem, and then you, you stem all the words that also exemplify that. And here you see the difference. So wonder is wonder, but change is chung, and night is night, that is let, think, get, mourn, morning, Sustained in here, the lemmatization, but here we've got more. Remember, different. Well, different hasn't changed yet, but it was different, so it did change. Do you see the difference? And, uh, well, what I was trying to basically get at, you also see the code here. Okay, now we have basically completed this basic NLP pipeline. We have a bunch of words or a bunch of tokens mapped to their dictionary form. We have already taken out stop words that we believe to not contribute to whatever we want to do with this text. We can now proceed with mapping that to numeric format. And I left this little bit of code in here. Um, that, that shows you how you can do that using functionality of scikit-learn. Keras also provides us with some nice functions to deal with text. Well, they perform similar tasks, so it doesn't matter too much which one you like better. Um, we use you know, the label encoder and the one hot encoder. You've seen them before, you maybe remember that. Both very useful um, for text data. And, well, they are, they are very useful for text data, but they generally also work with other type of data. So we need to do some translation here. I'm basically converting my text to a NumPy array. And then we have the whole text after the lemmatization, everything as a NumPy array of length 18, which is the number of tokens that we are dealing with. That's also our vocabulary size for this tiny example. No words, but these 18 words occur in our text that we will need later on when designing neural network layers. And, well, it's the same type of approach. Now, if we want to use the functionality that we um, just imported, we, we need to create an object, label encoder, that I can use in order to map my tokens to integers. That's the purpose of this label encoder. Uh, we need to fit that, fit and transform. And here we need our NumPy array. First, we show our text to the encoder. The encoder has now a chance to scan through the text and determine the number of, of words, and then build its internal mapping tables from words, from tokens. Better to say tokens here. In our example, we talk about words, but our tokens in general could also be something like subwords. So the encoder will build this mapping from the token to an integer. And this is what we get as a result. Well, just a bunch of integers. And well, with these, we can then proceed and build our one hot encoding. 
for individual votes. Currently, well, as you can see, this is just the integer representation. In order to map that to one hot vectors, which are typically the input to NLP models. We basically proceed um, as before. For the one hot encoder, we can specify whether we want the one hot means that we get vectors, the majority of elements of which are zero. That's the notion of one hot, right? And um, well, it's it's actually more efficient to store that in a sparse server. Um, I'll show you. Well, it's probably best if I just show you the result. Encode it. I need to do some uh, reshaping. Why do I? What about this reshaping? Well. Shaping is needed because if you have a look at that, the result of label encoder fit is an uh, 1D array. And as often with scikit learn and functions, we expect our data as a proper vector. So basically, before going on, I'm reshaping that. So that I have a proper vector. You've seen that before. Let me call that. Later on, I left some code in the notebook, so I have to make sure that the names of my variables um, match what I uh, have already programmed in the later part of the tutorial. This is why I'm looking a little bit at the variable names here. So um, one hot encoder. Fit transform, and we are feeding it this just reshaped array of our uh, our tokens and their integer representation. But there is a little yeah. There we go. That doesn't work. And here we go. Well, before looking at the output, let's inspect the shape. It's now 18 by 18. That makes sense. I mean, we have 18 words, each of which we want to um, encode using this one hot format. So we need basically 18 digits or yeah, digits is okay to store every word in this one hot space. And then our output, our encoded data is 18 by 18. which obviously is a little bit difficult to look at, but uh, you can make sense of that. And just for illustration, well, if we, well, we, we don't really get the, the output natively, but um, basically what the, sparsity attribute here or argument um, is about is that going back once more if you look at this data here it's absolutely unneeded to store all these zeros which are numbers it's an nd array by default the data is stored as a float, go down a little bit, and then we get, that's not out, but me the data type, but these, these numbers are stored as floats. So every zero really costs you some memory. 
and then the sparse encoding where you just store the position where the single one in this vector is available is a lot more efficient. But um, we will not make use of that. First of all, any subsequent function that you plan to use has to support sparse data. That's a thing to consider. And well, personally, also for the tutorial, I like the data to be um, easy to look at. And this one hot matrix is still reasonably easy to look at. We also looked at some individual words here. Um, so let's skip that bit and rather move on with the LSTM. Now that we have our, our, um, our data ready and en encoded, we have this one hot matrix here. That's basically our, our X, our data. And we could try to use that data and put it in an LSTM model for language modeling. That's the next part in this tutorial. That's my goal. And remember, in a language model, the point is that we have a model, we feed it with text, and the model predicts the next word in the, the sequence. The word that follows the word we put in. We put one word into the language model, and it tells us, OK, so the next word is going to be this or that. It's Yeah, that's basically uh, what, what language models do. And well, LSTM is a popular choice for building language models, or at least it used to be a popular choice for building language models. And an RNN, you know how, how they work. We take a sequence of text, maybe three or four or five words. That is our token sequence. And then we feed that token sequence one by one into the LSTM. It will compute every hidden state. And then, depending how we set up the, the LSTM, if we set it up as a many-to-many -many mapping, from every single word that we put in, we can pull out a forecast, or we can get a forecast, which is then the next word in the sequence. And that is language modeling. And um, I just copy-pasted the helper functions we were using earlier on to take my data and turn that into a language modeling format, in a format suitable for language modeling. Well, conveniently, this function, create data set, is, is really the same that I was using earlier in order to build me input data for time series forecasting. There, we also created data that had some value x t at time point t, a value at time point t, as the target, and then used independent variables xt minus 1, xt minus 2, xt minus 3, xt minus window size plus 1 as input. And that's the same type of data I need for language modeling, so the function is not new to you. And then if I make it a choice how long my window is, how long my sequences are that I'm going to put into the LSTM. I'm using time steps equal to three here. So basically I'm saying I want to give the model three words and then it should predict me the next word. After seeing three words, give me the next one. My, my context window to code it like that is three tokens. I'll give the LSTM three tokens and ask it what's the next token in that sequence. Okay, so um, we are invoking the function create data set with this time step equal to three. And we put in our one hot encoded matrix or data. Let's run that. And here's the resulting data that we get. We have Capital X, which is, well, the three is easy. That's just the number of time steps. The 18, as you might remember, is the size of our vocabulary. We have very small vocabulary. We are dealing with just 18 words, very little, 18. Which means that every one hot vector 
has 18 dimensions. One is a one, and then with these 18 element factor, I can one hot encode every word in my tiny vocabulary, if that makes sense. And to represent three of these one hot encoded words, my second dimension here, my second axis, in that tuple is three, and the 15, that's just the number of samples that I have in my data set. We had these 18 tokens, but we said that we consider a window of size three, so I need at least three tokens in order to be able to predict a next one, to in order to get something like a target token for my language model. So I am losing three elements, and that is why we end up with 15 samples. If we change that, so we have a slightly larger text window that we show to our language model, then the number of samples further reduces. And same if we give our model a shorter window. Well, that's not very exciting and it's also not new, so let's move on. And then this is basically the data we put into our model. That's one input sequence. This is how the input sequences to our LSTM look like. Vectors of 18 elements, the majority of which is zero and one is not, and three of these. And the output is also a one hot vector, which is the next word after coming after these three words. I will not set up my LSTM as a many-to-many -many mapping. I could, but then I would, as well, as demonstrated last time, also need a different data structure for the output. I would need a different Y. My, why is this behaving? Somewhat funny. Funny. All right. So. Um, since we will work with this encoded data, it would at some point be needed um, to, to revert that. Getting from the, for example, we might want to know afterwards, after the LSDM gives us one prediction, we might want to know uh, which word it predicted to occur. So um, let's have a quick look at how we can do the decoding from the one hot vectors back to the original words. And well, if I have, let's say I have the the second, the third target we had, which is this, and let's say I want to know which word actually is that here. What word is this? Well, the first thing I need to do is I need to get the index of my word. Because this is how we did the encoding from from words to integer indices to one hot vectors. And if I want to revert this chain, I have to do it bit by bit. So the first thing is, what's the index of that word? We have y2 and we want to know uh, the integer index. That's easy using uh, numpy here. Uh, we can just use argmax. And argmax will tell me where I can find the single one in that one hot vector. So I find it at position five. And hence, that is basically my integer code for this word. And now that I need know the integer code, I can basically print out, well, let's get rid of the print, the more important bit is, Previously, we used the object label encoder to map from words to integers. To be on the safe side, let's have a quick look before we continue here. Let's check once again how we did it. We had the label encoder. 
we fitted it in our tokens and then we got an encoded text which was the sequence of integers one number for every unique word and from that we developed our one hot encoding and we have seen that the one hot encoding we can revert using numpy argmax which will give us the position of the one um, for example in our in our list here note the second element has the integer two and if you look carefully you see that in our one hot matrix the second element which is this also has the single non-zero entry at position two using numpy argmax i can find out that the word i am looking for has the non-zero element at position x whatever x is and using that i will now use the label encoder object again but instead of coding the data i will revert that let's see how label encoder dot um, there is inverse transform and this inverse transform we basically give an integer and it will give me the word corresponding to that integer that's the idea in theory that's the idea but apparently um bad input shape let me have a quick look ah, okay so uh you see that the parameter that is expected is a numpy array of shape samples and that's not really what i gave to the function but i think it will suffice if i just wrap that up in an array here Here we go. I'm not entirely happy with that. Let me, well, I don't want to lose too much time. Let me copy, paste some code from the solution. Somehow I managed to do something wrong in this bit here. What you'll see in the notebook when you downloaded it from GitHub, is that we just go through the input data um, using this loop and then using exactly what, what we did before the label encoder inverse transform and then we give it one word which was one hot coded and this one hot coding we revert using numpy.argmax very much as before so with that Obviously, I am not willing to give up. Nope. I need to look at that. Um, anyways. It was, was it just what? But probably it was just the word get and everything was as expected. Probably it was just the word get. Is it right, Knight? Let's think. Could be. 
could be the um, could be that the word <laughs> word I was looking for actually was get I didn't check before. Probably it was. Anyways, um, yeah, as I wrote here, look at that. It is hard to think of text as vectors and matrices. I agree. Uh, you'll soon get used to it. As you could see, I am still in the process of doing this. Um, but I think you got the idea. We have this chain of coding from words to integers to one hot. And whenever we want to know what word some code really maps to, we need to undo this chain bit by bit. So from one hot to integer to word. That is what inverse transform combined with numpy argmax allow us to do. But I was probably you some LSTM, so let's try to build up our LSTM language model. And um, we will once again make use of Keras. Oops. And as before, we need our sequential class. And we need some layers. We will need a dense layer and an LSTM layer. You could also play with dropout if you wish, but it's not really worth it in this example. So that will do. Uh, for every LSTM, we need to decide on the dimensionality of the hidden space or pick five. And we will also need the size of our vocabulary when setting up the LSTM, which we can well get from our input data. Remember that the shape of the input data is 15 by 3 by 18, which is nice because it's already in the form that LSTMs like. Samples, time steps, features. Our words are one hot encoded. We, we, we did that to present them numerically. And yeah, it makes, it makes sense. These are individual dimensions characterizing the word. One hot coding is not very meaningful, as you know. There is no semantic relationship between one hot vectors, as we established in the lecture. But still, it's a numeric representation, and these 18 latent dimensions, um, well, not sure I may call these dimensions latent, probably not. Bear with me. These 18 dimensions, they represent the features that we have. And then, unlike in the previous tutorial, where we dealt with time series data, now we really have all these 18 features for three time steps. That is what we see here. That's one input example to our LSTM. Three by 18. And then the vocab size is just the number of features because my vectors are one hot. Right. Um, let's proceed. Um, We first of all create an object of this class sequential, and to that we then add layers. And well, the first layer we can add is an LSTM layer. We're building an LSTM language model, right? And you know that LSTM layers will want to know the size. And also, um, I will work with fixed input length and structure and whenever i know exactly what my input will be it's good practice to define the shape of the input right when setting up the lstm so i'm giving the argument input shape and providing this little tuple here which will be time steps or well equally i could use x shape one but this is the same thing. And the other is the vocab size. Or maybe let me make my code a little nicer. I'm using time 
depth and vocab size, so then I should also put time steps here, and everything is clear. Doesn't that sound wonderful? Okay, let me check. Millet looks good. We specify our input shape, the number of hidden units, that should do. And then, well, the next layer that we add to our model, that's going to be a dense layer because we're almost done. We just have one hidden LFDM layer to keep things simple. And that dense layer, we need the vocab size again. Vocab size, yeah. And um, because that is our output dimension. In a language model, we're trying to produce the probability distribution over words, and we have as many words as we, the number of words we've got is defined by our vocabulary. And this is why I use vocab size also as a dimension of my output layer, this dense layer. And what do we use as activation function? for a language model, and since we want a probability distribution, the choice clearly is softmax. And that is my model. Let me see whether this works. We just compile that, and we need loss, where we use, oh no, in, in Keras it's called categorical, Cross entropy optimizer. We use our good friend Adam and metrics. In addition to the loss, we can use accuracy as our performance metric so that we get also accuracy statistics as the output when training our LSTM. That's maybe useful. Um, and then, let's give it a try. We try to fit that model on our data X and Y using a, we need to get the batch size. Let's say we are doing online stochastic gradient descent, batch size of one, and we train that for, well, it's not going to be a great network anyhow. Well, 10 should do. And there is nothing wrong with shuffling our data because we have the sequences and it shouldn't matter too much which sequence we prevent in which order to our network. It's all about predicting the next word from the input sequences of length three token. Obviously, I made some mistake. Let me check. Invalid syntax. Okay. Uh, let me have a look. Okay, I'm doing it bit by bit in order to probably you saw it already, which is very mean. Um, seriously. And finally, my silly self has seen it as well. I hope that part was fun of you. I mean, you should also be entertained in that video, at least to a little bit. Um, so I hope you like me making a fool out of myself. Training, there we go. Mm, 20, 27% accuracy. Mm, doesn't look too good, does it? Um, 
yeah, but what we would we expect with this tiny little bit of, of data? Um, let's have a look at our model. So, whoops, come on, mice. Trained, done, everything worked out. I mean, let's let's be positive for a start. We just built our first language model in Keras. That's great. And um, the example was tiny, but that doesn't matter. We could play with different configurations of the LSDM. We can pimp the LSDM, probably making it deeper by stacking some LSDM layers on top of that. Much more importantly, we can assemble a much bigger data set where X and Y are a lot bigger than that, but that's really what we need in order to build our language model, which is well pretty amazing, I think, how, how easy that was. And um, I left some code here how to that demonstrates us some predictions. Let's say we predict the last three words in our text. So I'm, I'm going back to my matrix X, which has all the data. And then I'm pulling out the last three sequences and trying to create a density plot over my prediction, just to, to get a feeling for, well, if I give it these three tokens, the LSTM will predict me the next word in the sequence. And more specifically, it will deliver me a density distribution over words. So basically in that bit here, I'm taking a look at the density. And I thereafter extract the three most probable words using numpy arc sort. So it will sort the predictions in Y hat. Well, maybe let's take it bit by bit. Let's split that up here. And first of all, create our density plot. There we go. These are the densities over our words in the vocabulary. Okay, hmm. looks a bit like a density, but not so special. Maybe one more. Let's look at our forecast. It's maybe more interesting. And here we go. These are the outputs that we get from, from our LSTM. Obviously a matrix and we can count the elements and um, to end up with a number of, of 18. Um, and we immediately see that there are three outputs because we, we fed our model with three sequences and got these predictions. So that all makes sense. And um, I was also trying to extract what are the most probable words that the LSTM produced for a given input word? So this is this bit here, um, creating this dictionary Y with the actual target, label encoder and verse transform. We've seen that above. We basically revert the encoding for the last three words in our sequence. And the predictions for these words, we're going to fill up in this little for loop here. So maybe for the for the first start only. We have this output here for the actual targets are great and puzzle. And that indeed was the end of our demo text after doing the lemmatization, stop word removal, etc., etc. And um, now let's check what the LSTM predicts when we when we show it these words are great and puzzle. Um, here is the for loop. We get the three most likely words according to this index that we developed earlier on, and then just populate this dictionary. So um, for R, 
we get predictions with decreasing probability morning, feel, and world. Feel, puzzle, and morning. Puzzle, feel, and little. Well, the true sequence was our great puzzle. Um, so on the positive side, if we feed the network the word great, then at least we get a reasonably high probability R forecast for the next word being the word puzzle, which actually is uh, true. It's a tiny toy example. You wouldn't expect any good results. But um, that does make does make sense. It's maybe already an overstatement, but you see that you get uh, at least um, forecasts for likely words. And by the way, maybe a little uh, takeaway here is that if you think about it from this toy example, you give it, you give the LSTM one word, you ask it to produce a probability distribution over words, and you get a probability distribution. Here we are pulling out only the top three words. If you think about it, um, in these probability distributions, several words might be on, on the edge. I mean, here, for instance, these two words pretty much get the same probability. And that might be the case reasonably often, that there are some words that are likely. And what this teaches us is that if we want to build a model that generates language, we should be a bit careful of our, whether this model should really, uh, after giving a probability distribution over words, use only the most probable word as forecast, as next word in the sentence that this model is to create. And what models for language generation do to be smarter at this point is they don't only go for the most likely word, next word, morning, feel, and puzzle. Rather, they would consider a set of probable words and then sort of build up a tree. Um, what if I output morning as the next word in my sequence? How would the probability distribution then look like for the next word after morning? And how would it look like if I use in my output text the word feel? And then in the next round, let my network predict the most likely next word if the current word is, is feel. If you're interested in language generation and want to look a little bit at the, the output side of a deep neural networks and how they can be used for language generation with RNN, you already know a lot. Uh, have a look for beam search. That's the algorithm that's commonly used here in order to be a bit smarter than just using the most probable word as the next word when you want to generate some language. Good. Um, but we really did well. We developed our first language model. Let's bring up the summary again and just as a little exercise to deepen our LSTM expertise, try to make some sense out of these 588 parameters that we find in total. And um, in one of the last tutorials, I basically left you with the task to make sense out of these summary outputs and work out the number of parameters. We can try doing that. Um, well, first of all, the, the 108, that is fairly simple, I believe, because we have an output dimension of size 18, right? So our, our output layers, our output layer weight matrix that connects the LSTM layer and the, the output layer where we see 18 units is 18 by the number of hidden units in our LSTM layer, which was five. So we have five hidden units, and these are fully connected by 
these 18 output units that already give us 90, but only 90, not 108. But um, as you might remember, or as you should remember, in the output layer, we have for each output unit one bias. So we need to add these 18, and this is how we get the number of free parameters in the output layer. That's easy enough. More interestingly, how do these 480 parameters emerge? How, where's that coming from? And well, if you want to work that out, it's important to remember how the LSTM works internally. And that you have these individual matrices that operate these gates, input for get and output gate. And also we've got the self state and the parameters that we need for that bit. And well, that is the notation from the lecture. Also, we need to take care about the bias units. That's the notation that we made use of in the lecture. And if you wanna, if you wanna Now, we recalculate the number of LSTM parameters. Uh, what you can do is, well, let's ignore the, the bias for start. We basically have our vocabulary size, which is 18. And we have that times the, the number of hidden units, which is NB hidden in my code. That's basically from the input onto the hidden layer. That's this bit. And in addition, that's this bit xt times wxi, for instance. And um, also we've got the weights for the hidden layer transitions, which is basically 18 square. Now, and in addition to that, we then need once again the, the biases, which basically have the, for this to, to work out, we need the dimensionality of the hidden layer again. Sorry about that, that's NB hidden. And this gives us 120. And that is for, well, for one of these gates or for likewise the calculation of the candidate hidden state. And we have these four equations, we have these four mini neural networks and multiplying that by four, then basically, but not in that way, but in that way, gives us the number of weights that we also see in the summary. Well, that was obviously not connected to NLP, but I was promising you in the last tutorial that we will have a look at how to recalculate these parameters. So at least I wanted to make up for that. And it's it's useful to do these exercises to really remind us how how LSTM works. They are still quite new, and now we are looking at Keras. And we have this LSTM layer, and that might make us, of the complexities that we have here, might make us forget the part of the lecture. So um, that is why I think it's a good idea to also revisit that a little bit. Um, let's play a little bit with the weights that we learned when training the LSTM. The model that we trained basically has in Tunnel data store or the, the, act, the, the object that we created, this model object, has a ways to access, access the layers. It basically keeps a stack of the multiple layers, the input and the, the dense layer, these two layers. Uh, now we can index like that. Models.layer0 will give me 
my LSTM layer goes in the architecture. The LSTM layer is the first one, which has the index zero. And uh, Mulligan layers one will give me the dense output layer. So I can access these layers. And then use get weights. And give me some, some weights. Let's run that code here. Okay, so the result of that is a multi dimensional data structure. We have more specifically, we have three tuples. And each of these tuples, which actually is an array, has dimension 18 by 20, 5 by 20, and 20 by by one. And it's, well, we, we can actually make sense out of these numbers. Um, the five is the number of hidden units that we have, for instance, and then five times that gives us 20. And 18 is the vocabulary size. So these numbers do make some sense or do ring a bell already. Um, I have made some comments before that the internal storage in the Keras LSTM class does not quite follow the way we introduced that in the lecture based on our textbook and is maybe better understood by having a look at Chris Olaf's famous LSTM blog, um, where, let me scroll down a little bit. Chris Ola would in his blog present the equation for the different gates. That is an example from the input gate rather in this way. And then say that in his input, we have one matrix W. Well, I introduced two earlier on. Um, Chris uses one, which then has all the weights for the hidden state of the previous iteration and the new input combined. It's mathematically equivalent. The thing is that this is basically more representative for the storage of the weights in Keras, where we have this one big matrix. And then that four times, this is how we arrive at this, well, four times four by five is this 20 and 18 is the vocabulary size. On the web, I found this utility function that we can use to, well, extract the weights that we get here from the function get weights and organize them in the LSTM matrices. Let me quickly run this function. And basically what this function does is, again, I, well, I credit the original code. It's just reorganizing these, these weights that come out of the training of the LSTM and then basically give me a, um, is it a dictionary? Yeah, it's, it's a dictionary where we can get the input, forget, output, and self state and the corresponding weights. Just that the weight that we get here, let me run that, they are all 18 by 5. To understand these dimensions, you have to be aware that you can also rewrite the equations of the LSTM in this way. And then this makes a lot of sense because if you think about that, we have hidden state, we have x, the input, then 18 by 5 is exactly the dimensionality of this input matrix w here that we, that we need. So after running this function, we have access to the object em, and then we can index with em using i, f, o, and c, which were just some keys that we that were defined in that function for the gates. And these are the four equations that I was stating above, but reformulated in this format. And then using em of e, for instance, we basically get the weights that map our tokens into the LSTM layer. And let me run that maybe. So it's this big matrix. 
once more. It's A by 5. And what I wanted to highlight here is that actually that already is an embedding matrix. We haven't really designed one uh, explicitly, but we have encoded our data. We have mapped it to integer numbers, the tokens, and then one hot encoded these integers of these, these, these tokens. And these tokens were then put into the LSTM by a weight matrix. For example, by this weight matrix here, this 18 by 5 weight matrix for the, for the input gate. And in that regard, this matrix, what it does is really, it, it does map tokens to a vector representation words that were just one hot encoded to a dense representation of five numbers. We have for each, that is the 18 here, we have for each of the input words here, the five dimensional embedding. That is what this big matrix is about. Or we have, uh, I should say, we have a uh, embedding because for the other gates, uh, the matrix matrices have the same shape, 18 by 5, same for the others, and they also take the input and map it into the LSTM. And we can can consider that an embedding matrix. So we can play with that. Uh, for example, I'm just creating a word think here, which is part of my vocabulary. If you go back, revisit the famous quote that we're using here, think is part of the text, and I encode the word think in my internal mapping table from words to integers, that is the 16th element with an index of 15, and then this 15, after reshaping that, I can dummy code it, then I get the one hot representation of the word think. And then I can simulate what is going to happen if I put that word think in this one hot representation into my LSTM or what happens at the input gate. And well, that's nothing but computing the dot product between my input gate and my one hot encoded word. So uh, word dummy dot em of i. And there is my embedding. I just learned an embedding of the word think with this tiny little toy example. Fair enough, the embedding is not going to be very powerful, but that really is um, our first embedding. And it's very hard to see, but if we look at the weights like once again and compare that to the embedding that we calculated here with the dot product, then you might notice something. Clearly not by looking at the big matrix here, 18 by 5, but if you try to think what we what we did and we, we dummy encoded the word think, and then we calculated the dot product. So it was, uh, let me check. So it was this 118 dot product with the 18 by 5 matrix to obtain this 1.5 result, but the, the input was 100 coded. Long story short, we just copied one row of our embedding matrix. And previously I was showing you in my mapping from words, tokens to integers, think is word number 16. So uh, that is the third to last bit. And indeed, if you now look at that, here you go. That is the word think. It's exactly the same as we result or, or entry that we also get here from calculating the dot product, which is maybe reassuring in that what we are doing here, despite not having much data, does make some sense. And we can redo that. 
we have our embedding matrix here or an embedding matrix here. And one thing for the last part of the tutorial that I want to highlight is that this approach, one hot coding the word, and then learning the weights in the input layer as part of a training, it is feasible, but it's it's not very efficient because that is really what's going to happen when we input text into our neural network. These dot products are going to be calculated, which is not a problem in our tiny example. In general, however, if the vocabulary size is large, then we are calculating, and also if the, if the hidden dimension is large, we are, we are calculating some reasonably high dimensional dot products here, although all we do is basically just looking up one row or column from a matrix that can be done much more efficiently. And in the last bit, I just want to, well, remember embeddings, but I trust that you follow the lecture carefully enough to remember what embeddings are. Keras has specific layers for this purpose that work more efficient than just inputting the text. And that's what the reminder of the tutorial essentially does. So um, just to remind ourselves, embedding means mapping words to vectors. And in terms of the desiderata, we would like these vectors that we embed or, or learn as part of the learning the embedding matrix. We would like these vectors to exhibit some uh, patterns like facilitating these mathematical operations where we compute vector similarity differences also the famous king minus man plus woman equals queen example from Vertuvec, you will certainly remember and our tiny example was not enough to learn embedding vectors that are this powerful but it's getting there Yet, the way we use them is not very efficient. Better practice would be to have an embedding layer that takes care of mapping the input tokens, the one hot encoded words, onto the, into the neural network without explicitly calculating dot products, which can be quite costly. So the last bit of the tutorial introduces you to the Keras embedding layer, which is just yet a different layer um, that we can use. And we can use that layer for two purposes. The first and the most important purpose is to load pre-trained word embeddings like that from Vertuvec or Gluvi. That's the most important purpose. Sometimes, however, we might not want to use pre-trained embeddings and rather train our own embeddings as we did in the previous example. Even then, it's good practice to use the embedding layer because it's more efficient uh, due to avoiding dot product calculations where there are unneeded. Well, maybe a third use case uh, is to start from a pre-trained embedding and fine-tune it using your own data. That is also something that the Keras embedding layer will allow you to do. Um, so let's have a quick look in the last few minutes of this tutorial. Basically, what we are doing is we are importing a novel type of layer, which is this embedding layer here. And um, then we can add that to our neural network to make it more efficient. We can actually start with a very simple neural network just for, for illustration, where we, let's say, we pick an embedding dimension of, well, normally embedding dimensions are in the range of 100 or maybe 300, but with, with the little data we have, let's just pick 10, very tiny embedding dimensions. So we map the word to a 10-dimensional vector, okay? Right, um, I need to run this code, otherwise it's not gonna work. We once again create a new network using sequential. And then we add to that an embedding layer. 
where we need to specify the input dimension, which is our vocabulary size. Previously, there was 18. No, it was defined previously. So. Sorry about that. So I put it up there so uh, to basically remind you that the variable exists and that we can use it. So the input dimension to our embedding layer is a vocabulary size, uh, which does make sense because we put in one hot encoded words and the number of dimensions that we need in these one hot, one hot encoded words is equal to our vocab size. We also have an output dimension, which is just our embedding dimension and under full control. And in addition, we can specify the length of our input, which corresponds to the number of tokens that we put in. And here we can put time steps. That's another variable we created earlier on. And uh, that was equal to three. And when specifying the model in this way, we can, uh, I think, already ask for a little summary. Yeah, here we go. That's the embedding layer, or the, yeah, the camera's embedding layer. We don't yet know how many data points, samples we put in, that's this none value here, but we do know that we have windows of three tokens, each of which has 18 dimensions. Our embedding dimension is, is 10, so we'll map the inputs to these 10 embedding dimensions, and then the 10 by 180 Sorry, the, the 10 by 18 gives us this 180 parameters. It's just a dense layer where every input feature is connected to the to the 10 hidden nodes in our embedding layer. And then we have 10 by 18, 10, 10 hidden units by 18 features equal to 180. Right, um, so using that for, for language modeling is something that involves some few more challenges. And um, since we already did a lot, I wanted to simplify uh, things a little bit. We will go away from language modeling and look at a simple text classification task. So I, I put this demo data in here yet another toy data set, just some reviews, maybe comments on the lecture um, or examples of very short reviews, very pretty good, very nice, never again, better than expected, etc. And um, if we want to predict something from these reviews, we need labels. I'm elaborating here in the notebook text how that could be a task where we predict from student comments whether they will complete the course, i.e. participate in the final assignment, but you could also just imagine that to be a simple sentiment analysis task where we then have some labels here. Let me extend the size of my vocabulary a little bit. If I want to encode this data here, there are more unique words, and if I want to encode them, I need a larger vocabulary. And because I'm lazy, I will make use of some Keras convenience functions that map, look at that bit here, I'm defining a vocabulary size of 50, and then I encode my text, these reviews in one go, for single review in reviews, so predicting 
or encoding pretty good and then very nice and then good never again, um, each of these single reviews are encoded to a one hot matrix using this convenient functions one hot, very nice, short and sweet. And then I get these. You also know it's, it's one hot encoded, but the, the output looks different. It's this sparse type of output where this 46 here just means that that is a one hot vector of 50 dimensions, where at position 40, 46, let's say 46, um, we find the one and all the rest is, is zero. Nice and convenient function, this one hot thing, easier than the scikit learn version I was illustrating about, above, but uh, there is one one issue here, it's it's not so easy, and to be really honest, I haven't found a way, and I think it's not possible, but please correct me if you if you know how it works. I haven't found a way, and I think it's impossible to go back from this one hot representation that you get from the one hot function back to the original word. So by looking at the data, I can basically tell that 46, okay, that must be the embedding no, that must be the one hot version of pretty. And and 10 is the one hot version of good. And then the next review is pretty very nice, very nice. So very and nice are 17 and 18. Right? So so this is how, how that works, but you would like one function that easily allows you to go back from here to the original data. And I think that doesn't work. But if you know how it works, please let me know. Um, I'm interested if somebody uh, can come up with something. Because it uses a hashing function here. That uses a hashing function and that is not supposed to be revertible. It's a one-way function, I think. Anyways, um, you know, that is that is our, our input data. It looks different, but it's actually one hot encoded. So imagine again, imagine these to just be the positions and the one hot vectors where we find the one. Um, the longest review, then um, we need to know that in order to use embedding layers, the longest review uses five words. And if we want input sequences of a fixed length, we need to make sure that all our inputs are five tokens long. That's important. In practice, you will not be able to afford making every review as long as the longest review. Rather, you would increase the size of the very short reviews, which are maybe just the word great. And at the same time, you would reduce the length of the very long reviews that are very verbose. I'm illustrating padding here, which is the technique we need. Our reviews are short, so we all pad them with um, two maximum lengths of five. Let me just show you that it will become clear. And then from this representation of the data where we have sequences of different lengths, we obtain that representation of the data where all our sequences have the same length. And then we can use that input data here for text classification, um, setting once more an embedding dimension, is defining once more an embedding layer as before with these three inputs, input dimension, vocab size, output dimension, embedding size, and input length, now it's five, because I'm putting in sequences of max length five, that are all of length five, to be more precise. If I want to train this, I need to be able and compute some loss. To that, I put a dense layer on top of that and train that with binary cross entropy, because I have a binary task. The review is either one or zero, it's good or not or the students take the exam or does not take the exam, whatever our labels are supposed to mean. But for that to work, I must ensure that the embedding layer and the, the dense layer, that is my output layer, can speak to one another. And what is the way to do that is basically to add one other layer, a flattening layer, which is a layer without parameters, we just take the, the embeddings, which are individual embedded tokens, and stack them on top of one another. 
if I get five vectors, each of 10 dimension, 10 is my embedding dimension, and my max length is five. So for each of the five elements in my input sequence, I'm getting out 10 numbers from this embedding layer, 50 elements in total. And what this flattening does is it basically takes this five by 10 matrix and just stacks the columns on top of one another to create a one by 50 vector. And that one by 50 vector, that is, looks exactly like uh, a feature vector. I have 50 numbers. That is, I, I have an input with 50 features. That is exactly what I can train using a logistic regression, for example. And that's sort of what's going to happen here. We take this flattening layer, we flatten our embeddings into a, a vector, and that vector we put in a dense layer, which we train, where we use sigmoid activation and then train that using binary cross entropy, which is just log loss. So that bit here is actually logistic regression. That's how it looked like. And again, flattening layer, zero parameters. It's just reorganizing the shape of our data. Using Keras, that's also something we might need to pay attention to. Do the individual layers are really able to, to collaborate or to communicate? Is the flow of the data, is that well organized? Does it work out? Without that layer, without that flattening layer, it would not work out because I'm getting this five by 10 matrix out of my embedding, but I can't put that into a dense layer. A dense layer expect a 1D array or a vector as input. But using the flattening layer, I can make sure it doesn't work out. And with more complicated architectures, there is uh, obviously more that you need to pay attention to. Right. Uh, well, then we can train that, just train that for any type of epochs. I'm using 10. Um, my accuracy is not great, obviously. Well, it get up, gets up to, to 80%. So if we imagine that to be a sentiment analysis task, we would predict the sentiment of a review with 80% accuracy, which is okay. And I'm also demonstrating you here how you could basically approach the same text classification task, but using an LSTM. We haven't made use of an LSTM. What we have made use of was essentially a feed-forward neural network with this embedding layer. You could also use an LSTM. When we use an LSTM, um, we have LSTM layers as usual. And look at that. We have now our embedding layer first. So we first embed the words, and then we add an LSTM layer where well, we need to make sure that here the dimensionality of the data is okay. The LSTM layer expects 3D inputs, number of samples or batch size, time steps, and the number of features. That's gonna work out because we have seen before, or at least I've told you that the embedding layer is going to deliver as output this five by 10 data structure, which is tokens five by embedding dimension 10, number of features. So that is exactly what the LSTM layer expects. Hence, this combo here, embedding layer, LSTM layer should work perfectly together. And then that bit is also known to you. The output of the LSTM layer, we just put a dense layer on top of that. And since we face a binary classification problem, we don't use softmax, it's not language modeling, it's just sentiment or assignment participation prediction and train that using cross entropy. Takes a little while, also getting some warnings here. Turns out that the LSTM is not better. We could interpret that as the sequence in our tokens with the data does not carry much meaning. 
Thus, it might be better to just take the words individually and predict the sentiment by the presence or absence of certain trigger words, which, if you think about it, does make sense for sentiment analysis. So it's, it's plausible that the LSTM does not so work, but anyways, you know, every result that we produce needs to be taken with a grain of salt because we use toy data. Well, and then just some fooling around with the results, pulling out some of our word embeddings. We can do that as before with model layer zero. I can basically get the first layer, which now in this revised LSTM is the embedding layer. And then I can get the weights of the embedding layer where we get a list as result with only one entry. And that entry happens to be 50 by 10. 10 is, of course, our embedding dimension. And then uh, the 50, that is, that is, that is, that is, that is the data that we put in. We have the individual words. And each of these are represented by by 10, by 10 numbers, embedding dimension is 10. And I have earlier on, it's a long time ago, a very long time ago, it's, I didn't know that I did it here. When starting the text classification example, I defined the vocabulary size to be 50. That's more than the number of unique words that I have in my data, but because of this convenient functions, one hot and this hashing that goes on underneath, it's actually a good practice to work with a larger vocabulary than you have, slightly larger vocabulary than you have unique words in your data, because when you, when you hash, the, the tokens, it may be that there is a collision. There is some risk for the collisions and to manage that risk, it's good practice to make your vocabulary size or define that a little larger than what you would actually need. Uh, have a look at the documentation if you want to read uh, up on that. I also left some, some links somewhere in the notebook uh, here, for example, which further elaborate on these, these details. But since my vocab size is 50, and since my embedding dimension in this example is, is 10, the final result that we got makes a lot of sense. 50 by 10 matrix, that is exactly our embedding matrix. Once again, for every word in our vocabulary, we have the 10 numbers that represent these words, it's embedding. And with the embedding layer of Keras, unlike with the previous, well, example with the LSTM and its input gate, unlike that example, the embedding layer is really able to just extract the embedding of the word whenever it comes in its one hot form and does not calculate the dot product. Therefore, the embedding layer is more efficient, which is a reason why if you want to embed a word or generally tokens um, before putting that them into a new network, best practice is to use an embedding layer, even if that is not strictly necessary from a conceptual or mathematical point of view, as we've seen earlier on, much more efficient and clearly the best practice to do so. And with this, I want to complete this tutorial here on the foundations of NLP, the standard operations like stemming, like stop word removal, etc. We went through that, you have seen NLTK and how you can use that to work with your text data. And we have also seen some early examples how we can use recurring neural networks, how we can use LSTM to process these texts for classification or also language modeling. That were our two use cases today. And we have also introduced the embedding layer as the mechanism which we can use, that we should use because it's efficient in order to get text into our models 
and to learn a good representation for that text as part of training the network. Or else, as we will soon in the future, to use pre-trained embeddings when we download one. So, right, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and please stay tuned for some more tutorials on NLP. Thank you very much. Take care and bye-bye.